scarred and I've been bruised I have learned just what to do I need to leave my past behind me I need to look, look, look to the future No matter what will come No matter what I've done I know just what to do and that's all because of you. Are you okay, family? <laughs> welcome back to another Tuesday edition. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to my regular regulars. And a warm welcome to the people that have recently joined our family. I hope you've had ample time to catch up and bend and get acquainted with your faves. I know my regular people have even started a habit of repeating old videos. I know they hit different resonance when you've restructured how you think and your perspective has grown. And when you go back to original video, it just carries different merit and different meaning. For those that have never seen my face on the screen before, my name is Yana Mafumengwana and I'm the regular face behind UOK. UOK is a personal development and mental health channel and I'd like to opine your favorite, your favorite channel most guys, ne? So it's gonna be your favorite channel because it's favorite channel. Today is another Tuesday and we're doing something that is a little bit on the heavy side but so well timed um, and, and so relevant to the times that we're living in and that is grieving during COVID times or grieving that is relevant to COVID diagnosis and COVID complexities. I'm doing this because of so many people that have lost their loved ones to COVID and the grieving pattern has just been so different to our comforting ways that offer us relief in times of distress, but most importantly, the, the guilt that comes with preventability bias. Is it something that I could have stopped? Should I have sent them to hospital? That the foreseeability bias, should I have gone home more often, um, et cetera, et cetera. So people better with those. So it's, it's additional matters to grieve. Although grief alone is hard, but grief during COVID has just added dynamics that just make it so complicated, primarily because the things that make grief okay, that make grief settle in in, in bite sizes, are no longer in place, especially for African cultures, um, because there, there's just inbuilt methods um, of how we celebrate, of how we do rituals, of how we, we rely on one another to do stuff and people that are grieving now have had to do for themselves what normally is to be done by a community and you rely just on your nuclear family or you as an individual if your family is not that populated to do something that was previously the function of such a lot of people the church community members colleagues from work etc etc and we underestimate how those little things in grieving patterns actually make the grief process better you know we have Patterns we can warm up to and we know what to expect. And it starts to sink in slowly. The atmosphere in the worship song is somber. The, the atmosphere matches how you are feeling. You are normalized and you are validated. And it just looks like how you are feeling and how you are wounded is matched in their faces. Because you are mirrored in how you are feeling. Therefore, it's not overwhelming because it's not your feeling alone. When you look left and when you look right, this feeling is reflected in everybody's face. It speaks to the impact of the person that lived on other people then you realize how you think they meant is truly how they meant you know there is no discrepancy between how you are feeling and how society is responding and also there's a great deal of comfort to be found in religious spaces in Abanda through religious practices in the scriptures that comfort us and there's congregants that have words of wisdom to speak to us and those things haven't been there. That's been the biggest problem. The second biggest problem has been the absence of funerals, which has been the greatest saving grace in fighting the wave. But for most people, it's been such a letdown of a life that seems to be so magnificent. But if any paling at it, its ending doesn't, doesn't match its duration. Therefore, there isn't closure into it. There's so much honor because that's when I was in school. They've got their deficits, especially cost, but there's so much honor in the little program, the narration of how well this person has lived. And it balances the intensity of the fact that you lost and equalizes with the fact that they lived and they lived just as profoundly. And you get to understand that you are so hurt because you, you loved so deeply. And this is evidenced by how many other people loved this person. I would like those people to perhaps find comfort in the fact that even if you couldn't make it home, 
for the funeral. Even the people that were present at home did not have a funeral. Nobody had a funeral in your absence. Funerals did not happen. Burial ceremonies here and there that the government tried to accommodate Uba is Lozenze get close to his claim. But I hope you're not feeling guilty that you missed what is perhaps the most significant ending. A woman bomb to boom tand being a funeral. I'll post on my funeral like a kumdobe yili funeral. Even the people that were present in terms of proximity did not attend a funeral. That was not a funeral. Unfortunately, we can't leave the deceased in a pandle. So kunyanzi legili in wajiwe and we just gather whoever is vital for the actual proceeding to go ahead. You didn't let them down by not making it befitting send off. Nobody let you down by not coming to support you in your times of grief as well. And it is a miracle that we're beyond your control. But I hope I can delete the feeling of missing out or the feeling of betrayal or the feeling of envy towards the people that managed to be there. So I hope you, you can feel better and, and question yourself less that had I known, I would have gone home more often, I would have called more frequently, I would have done more video calls. That is, you know, last week we did hindsight bias, but it has an opposite, which is foreseeability bias. And foreseeability bias is very, very evident in COVID times, where it somehow, magically, you wish you could have foreseen and therefore act differently to reduce the guilt that you are now experiencing in the absence of those actions you wish you had implemented. Known how, I've seen the foreseeability bias riddle the people whose parents died in hospital or died in, in an attempt to, to try and make the situation better. But yo, especially the parents that contracted COVID in the hospital. This is the worst, worst, worst guilt for the people that facilitated that mission. When they feel like, hey, in a corona, apparently. And we are going to say, why this hospital? Maybe not this doctor. I didn't declare this full history when I spoke to the doctor. If many faculty details the diabetes in time, would the odds have been different? The answer is you don't know if the odds have been different. The answer is life and death are supreme and sovereign. They are not matters that you decide and that you negotiate. Otherwise, if death was something that we can accurately prevent. So I hope you know that with the data that I had on the table, I acted in the best interest of what was going to yield the best outcome. And the parts of the outcome that went in my control, unfortunately, yielded negative results that are now in pain. I wish we can start to learn that we can long for a different outcome without blaming ourselves for participating in the outcome that was aggressive. Because in hindsight, there isn't much we can do about it. We are I'm sending you lots and lots of comfort, especially the people that work in healthcare spaces and have the assumption that there wouldn't have been COVID in my home had it not been for my exposure. situation in Jayan. Of course, COVID happens when there's been a break in infection control somewhere. But to try and pin it to an exact person in an exact location, you're not going to have a definitive answer. Was it me? And if it was me, right down to the very first carrier whose intention was never to transmit COVID in the first place. Blame is comforting in that it, it makes us safe for future distress. When you can blame yourself, it comes with owning the role that you played. And it's comforting thinking that if I can avoid that next time, I will never be in this pain again. But blame is only useful if the accountability does belong to you. Then you account and you own it and you avoid the circumstance from presenting itself again. But blame is a useless emotion to experience when the accountability is not in your hands. And majority of the time, for loss that you have encountered with people that you dearly loved, the accountability did not solely and squarely belong to you. I hope the future will offer us enough times for restitution, for making of amends, for the funerals we couldn't attend, for the friends we couldn't support, for the love and affection and support we couldn't display. I hope you can find alternative and innovative ways to create your grieving patterns and your grieving rituals that are alternative to that one of honor and display that we used to have 
I know it was comforting. I know this is especially true for people that held prestigious roles in society. Where in that has fun in I is no ayo abana. So in that if ebe fanilo yindo e e e no no gnalena. We long for for a final display of our love in the send off. We long for a final exchange of verbal words to each other about what this person meant for us. There is something about pain that is shared that feels reduced. And this is not a luxury that we had in COVID times. So I'm not going to make this video long, but it is meant to one, offer words of comfort to the people that could not be there through hospitalization, lockdown restrictions, their own illnesses and isolation periods, whatever the reason was job losses and therefore finances to not visit home, those people, I want to comfort those people that couldn't, that couldn't go. I want to comfort the people who feel like if I acted in a different way, more than the duration of ambulance was in hindsight, we know details as means and I had I known those ahead of time, I would have acted differently. Death isn't something you can prevent. We do our best to avoid it, and we have never succeeded in the history of humanity. You can accept mortality. It's part and parcel of being human. It's the hidden terms and conditions of being human. The vehicle is different, and this one was one of the most disastrous we've seen and continue to see, but it's not something that you can completely avert. And I'm very sorry that life proved that to you. In the harshest of manners, and it, it could be a rude, but repetitive, it doesn't mind. I think that's also what has made us so desensitized in grieving COVID times. In Atimoku, significant installments are suddenly in a cool because it just feels like there's another one waiting around the corner and another one waiting around the corner, and you don't want to cry all your tears today, and you don't want to express all the despondence because your mind is very protective. It knows what pain it can't manage. So people have become avoidant, people have become desensitized. Where it's just a matter of, oh, okay, you know, uh, because the stats long turned into faces and names, and now it's a matter of who and how close they were to you. But and that is also, you're not cold, you're not harsh. Desensitization is a protective mechanism when the pain is too much to just be desensitized to it because it's not going anywhere and you're not going anywhere. I hope this will pass and peer experts will figure out ways of how to combat the trauma that we have survived. But I hope social distancing has not meant emotional distancing. I hope you found ways to connect with the people that you love, even if you can't physically visit them. But the most important message of this entire episode, you did nothing wrong. This isn't something that you could have prevented, not on your own. This is so many collective little dynamics that have led us to where we are at the moment. And it's a turnaround that needs so many interventions that aren't just yours alone, but most importantly, there isn't an action that you took that was solely and exclusively responsible for the outcome. And finally, to the people that couldn't be there, you didn't miss the funeral of the person that you loved. There was no funeral. And I hope when all of this is over, we can create spaces that are receptive and warm and attending of the injuries as a kuzungoku. But grieving is unique in these COVID times. And I'm sending you lots of love and lots of comfort and perhaps borrowing you the language to give to the experiences that you are feeling. Why am I feeling bad for taking mama to hospital? Why am I feeling bad for ngagwazu kwesha? Why am I feeling guilty for choosing this particular network of hospitals over that one? Why am I feeling guilty for bangazang in Bafa Kuki Medical Aid? Why am I feeling guilty, etc., etc., etc.? These biases are always a way of appraising a situation in an attempt to make sure it doesn't happen again. Appraise it, but take the accountability that belongs to you. And for what it's worth, I'm sorry. And if indeed blame does belong to you, I hope the future can offer you opportunities of restitution and making amends. But most of the time, I guarantee you, it wasn't your fault. Okay, I'm going to step off now and have a Tuesday. Good.